Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a Bushmaster assault rifle. Now let me get the immediate obvious thing out of the way, and that is assault rifle is a pretty loaded term these days. In this case, its significance is simply that that is the name that the designer gave this. It wasn't so much of a loaded term in the early 1970s when this rifle was designed. So it's stamped right here on the side, Bushmaster Assault Rifle. You'll see that in just a moment. So with that out of the way, what is this thing? Where did it come from? Well, the 1970s are a period when the idea of the modern military rifle was in the United States was really making a transition from the old walnut and walnut and blued steel of the M14, um, perhaps walnut and parkerized seal of the M14, to the aluminum and plastic and fiberglass and small caliber M16. And as that happens we see a bunch of designers looking to make similar style rifles with various improvements. Sometimes you know improvements that they think will make them run better, or just ways to make them more cost effectively. This is kind of the new trend in military rifles, and so a lot of people want to get in on that. You of course could go to Colt and buy yourself a Colt AR-15, and at that point Colt owned the technical data package to those rifles, and they did, you didn't have the plethora of manufacturers of, of AR-15s like we do today, now that that data package is much more out in the open. And so instead small designers would come up with their own patterns. Now in this case the designer we're talking about is a guy named Mac Gwynn. Uh, these rifles were initially made by Gwynn Firearms Company, which was of course his. Um, that company would be, or the, the rifle design would be transferred slash the company sold. The details of this transaction are a little bit vague to me, uh, but it would become the Bushmaster Firearms Company, which yes is the same Bushmaster that went into, they, they would stop making these and start making AR-15s, and became far better known for that than they ever were for this. But that's why uh, you will see the original ones are the Gwyn uh, well, it was still the rifle was called the Bushmaster assault rifle, made by Gwyn. This one is the Bushmaster assault rifle made by Bushmaster. That's the explanation for that change in manufacturers. And there were some changes in the design at the same time, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But back to the designer, Matt Gwyn. There's something really significant about his prior experience. So first off. Um, he was a United States Army Special Forces veteran from Vietnam, rose up to the rank of captain, and was, as far as I can tell, the only like officer level guy in, the, in US Special Forces who actually had extensive time uh, carrying and using a Stoner 63A. And it's very easy to see the influence of the Stoner 63 in the Bushmaster. He came back from Vietnam clearly with a preference for the Stoner over the pseudo gas impingement AR-15, and I think that appears to have led a lot of his design choices for this. Uh, also worth noting that this wasn't his very first rifle project. Before this he was involved in some of the work of John Foote, who had a bunch of interesting but never successful uh, small arms designs in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, Gwyn took Foote's FAC-70, which never got into production, and, and sort of improved and iterated on it to his own design called the Ranger 7, which also never made it into production. And it was after that that he went about designing the Bushmaster. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what exactly he designed with this Bushmaster. I know everyone's going to want to see receiver markings, so let's just go straight to that. All right, like I said, Bushmaster Assault Rifle made by Bushmaster Firearms, so this is like the second generation of this rifle. Uh, Bushmaster was in Portland, Maine, Gwyn had been in Bangor, Maine, and then we have a caliber which is 5.56, and a serial number. Moving on to controls, we have a selector switch back here. Uh, this uses AR-15 fire control parts, so the selector switch is identical. Bushmaster made their own actual uh, selector lever with a B in it for Bushmaster, but we have safe and fire, just like an AR-15. Uh, there were some full auto of these made prior to 1986 and registered as transferable, but this one, and most of them, uh, is semi-automatic only. The charging handle is up here on the left side, and it is reciprocating. We'll get to that in another moment. Magazine release is standard AR-15, and it uses all standard AR-15 magazines. 
These were offered with both fixed and folding stocks. The fixed stock was wooden. Some of them, uh, especially the early Gwyn ones I believe, left wood coloured. The Bushmaster ones were actually painted black. The folding stock is obviously very reminiscent of a paratrooper Fowl or Galil. There is a very simple latch here on the side that push in and it lets you fold the stock. Unfortunately it's missing on this example, but there was originally actually a magnet that clamped onto the stock here that would, uh, well, attract itself to the steel receiver of the gun and hold the stock in the folded position. That magnet is however long gone, and so there's nothing that holds the stock in place. I mentioned that the fixed stocks were wooden, well the handguards on all of them are also wood, and in this case painted black. That is a factory thing, they were, this isn't Bubba deciding to paint his Bushmaster black, that's how they actually came. And we have essentially M16A1 style sights. We have a two position uh, flip aperture here, you can adjust it for windage on the rear sight, and you can thread the front sight post up and down to adjust for elevation. That is a standard M16 or AR15 front post. The barrel is 18 inches long with a just generic birdcage flash hider on it. Some of them came with a clamp on bayonet lug. You'll see that if you go looking for pictures of other examples. Now a couple things to point out before we go any further. The Bushmaster version of this rifle uses a sheet metal upper. You can see the stamped sort of divots in it up here. Uh, and it has a charging handle on the left side. The Gwyn guns actually used a cast aluminum upper, uh, and they had a charging handle located on the very top. The Gwyn guns are also recognizable because they have a rear sight assembly that looks very much like a Stoner 63. It's quite a bit longer, has a couple of uh, lightning holes in it. Bushmaster got rid of that, uh, they went to a steel receiver, a steel upper receiver on these, and this style of rear sight. Both guns, however, used an aluminum lower receiver. Now, uh, for disassembly we have two pins in the gun, front and rear. The rear pin is easily removed. Typical tool for this is a cartridge case. It is a captive pin, so we can pull that out and pivot the lower assembly down. Now the front pin is a little more complicated. That one is actually retained with a little e-clip. So in order to take it out I have to pop that e-clip out. There it is. And now the front pin comes completely out. And with that done we can separate the upper and the lower. A couple things to point out here, there's a rubber buffer that is built into the gun, again a factory piece, to cushion the last impact of the bolt carrier. There is also no serial number on this lower because this uh, predates some of the policy that has been set in place by the AR-15, and on the Bushmaster the upper assembly is in fact legally considered the firearm. Uh, oh, and standard M16A1 pistol grip on there. So standard fire control group, standard pistol grip, uh, standard magazine release, all, all of that is the same. Now one of the interesting things about the Bushmaster is that the recoil spring is located up here, and that is our gas piston, and it is compressing the recoil spring inside this tube when the bolt goes back. So in order to get that out we have to remove this little bracket. I'm going to do that by pushing forward on this right here. I can then pull this clip out, and now when I pull the bolt back I am not compressing the recoil spring. In order to get this the rest of the way out we're going to rotate that portion until the flat side is up so that it will fit under the receiver. Pull the bolt handle back to that round opening, I can then pull out the handle, and then the bolt carrier and op rod come out. Before we take a closer look at the bolt group let's just check in on the receiver here. This is a piece of folded sheet metal. There are a pair of uh, stiffening bars that double as guide rails for the bolt carrier that are welded to the inside. 
you can see this was folded around and the rear lug, the rear pin connector for the lower, welded in place. We have a square trunnion up at the front also welded in place, not the world's smoothest best welds ever. And if you get this in the right light you can see the spot welds on those internal rails. So there's one, there's one. We've got one really visible here, right there where it actually kind of ate into the ejection port a little bit. That's the, there's another one, that's the sort of standard of manufacturing that we have here. And then we come to the bolt carrier group. So bolt carrier where we, with a and typical AR-18 style of rifle, we would expect to have this as a standalone thing and then a short stroke gas piston on top. In this case it is a long stroke gas piston. So um, the piston is articulated, kind of like a Kalashnikov, and the spring is captive on here. So to get the spring off you would drive the pin out that's holding this piston in place, take that off, then the spring comes out. You can get a better idea of some of the crude manufacturing elements in the bolt carrier. You can see that the carrier itself has been welded to this just block bar sort of uh, assembly at the back there and at the front here. If we want to take this apart it is going to be very AR-15 or AR-18 like. I've got a cutter pin back there that holds the firing pin in place. So we can pull that out. We can then pull the firing pin out. We can then pull the cam pin, that just falls right out. And this is an AR-15 cam pin that has just been ground down a little bit. And if we pull the bolt out, this is really interesting in that this clearly was started its life intended to be an AR-15 bolt with the stem back here, but the area that would be uh, the, the gas rings has been left solid uh, and that diameter just fits it into the bolt carrier there. So really sort of a hybrid style of, of design. Um, in not not even really necessarily an AR-18 hybrid. This is has elements that are more akin to AR-15 manufacturing, like this bolt. So that is the Bushmaster Assault Rifle uh, bolt group field stripped. And so there is the whole thing field stripped down. So what do you say we take this out to the range and see how it actually shoots? Shall we see if this actually works? Ag locks in. So far so good. Maybe. I had a round in the chamber, it just didn't want to fire. Hmm. Same thing. Live round, trigger went click. That'll kill a spinner run. Come on. I'm a little hesitant to mortar this thing, but that's I think the only way to get that round out. There we go. Yeah, no primer indent, just didn't want to fire. So these things have a not to stellar reputation for reliability, um, I think we're certainly seeing a little bit of why. I've got three or four rounds left in the mag. We'll try to get the rest of them out.
One more. So overall, it's actually a really pleasant rifle to shoot when it works. Recoil soft. The owner of this one happily has zero, taken the time to zero the sight, so it shoots quite nicely. You can see it's not difficult to hit with. It rattles, like a lot of bits of it rattle. It does not, uh, not build a lot of confidence from the general handling, the, this sort of thing. Um, a really good example of an early, like a 1970s early attempt at a, the, the new version of modern combat rifle. There are two different ways to look at the Bushmaster. You can look at it from a theoretical design perspective in which it's really quite an interesting gun. The gas system in particular, the long stroke piston, um, the spring up above the barrel are reminiscent of, of a number of other designs. Um, in some ways guns like the Daewoo K2s that are also long stroke uh, gas piston systems hybridized with AR-15 fire control parts. Uh, you can see elements of uh, like some of the early Berettas and the early SIG rifles with the gas with the um, recoil spring up above the barrel in front of the bolt here. It's a really interesting design. You can also look at this from a practical production perspective and go, wow, this gun is complete garbage. They are excessively crude. A lot of them have reliability issues. Uh, and to me this is really indicative of the challenge of taking a good design and turning it into a successful production gun. I feel like I harp on this a lot, but it's really hard to go from a single prototype to an actual production line, especially when you're trying to do it essentially bootstrapped uh, without the support and backing of a major firearms company. So I think that is a large part of what led Gwyn to sell this design to a larger company. I mentioned earlier on this was Bushmaster. Um, originally Bushmaster was a company called Quality Products that was a manufacturing machining company that decided to take on this. Uh, and they renamed themselves Bushmaster Firearms at that time. And I'll, as I also said at the beginning, the exact arrangement between Gwyn and Bushmaster is a bit fuzzy to me. I am led to believe that Bush, that Gwyn maintained an interest in Bushmaster for a while, so I'm not sure about all of the details there. However, um, you do see these coming into production and staying in production for a number of years before Bushmaster transitioned to building AR-15s instead. So these are still around today. Uh, you can find them. They're, they're one of those interesting like 1970s, 1980s new, nouveau collectible, I suppose. Um, they're definitely shootable guns, but don't expect perfection, and they're exceptionally crude guns on the inside. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, enjoyed taking a look at the insides of this one. Thanks for watching.